Okay, so I'll start with generalizations. Even in modern times, we continue to be fascinated with witches. Hundreds of films have been made about them, dozens of shows, and many, many books have been written. As the Harry Potter series reveals, we are both drawn to and repulsed by witches. And this has been true since the early 16th century. This is Veneziano's portrayal of witches writing to their Sabbath on a carcass. They are attractive or menacing, or both, grotesque or comical. Witches reveal a great deal about our attitudes towards women, particularly women with power or knowledge. Today, I would like to engage in a brief exploration of the historical context of the witchcraft trials, the attitudes towards women that inform those trials, and the lingering effect of the misogyny these trials fostered in many parts of the world. And a little bit of that misogyny. I don't know how easy that picture is to see, but um, Hans Baldung Green was very famous for his representations of witches, which he tended to make as older women, sort of grotesque. All right, but before I get into misogyny, I'd like to talk a little about the collection. And here's an image from the collection. This is an example of one of the many, the many very rare books and manuscripts contained in the Kroc Library Rare and Manuscript Division's Witchcraft Collection. It is the first image in print of witches flying on brooms from Molitor's work concerning female sorcerers and soothsayers, published in 1489. So the collection was gathered in the 1880s by Andrew Dixon White and his first librarian, George Lincoln Burr. Cornell's witchcraft collection is one of the most important in the world. In fact, I'd say it's the most important, but it's a crucial resource for scholars working on the origins and centuries-long extent of the witchcraft trials in Europe. As a historian, White was particularly interested in Reformation theology and concerned with the excesses of religious fanaticism that fueled the early modern obsession with witchcraft and demonology. He was also interested in the history of legal procedure and punishment. One might say that he was an early promoter of social justice. Cornell's collection contains early and original editions of all of the major works on witchcraft, including 14 Latin editions of the Malleus Maleficarum, the hammer against witches, a book that was only second to the Bible in popularity over the course of the 16th century. Think about that. The collection also contains multiple editions of works like Jean Baudin's The Demonomania of Sorcerers, a work which demonstrates how mainstream the fear of witchcraft was, as Baudin was a political theorist and advisor to kings. The advice these works give about how to identify and persecute witches was taken quite seriously. The presence of multiple editions published throughout Europe makes clear how widespread this hysteria became in the early modern period. So I'd like to offer you a brief history of the witchcraft trials. While the early Catholic Church condemned persecution of individuals for witchcraft, deeming it pagan superstition, starting in the 13th century, the church embraced the prosecution of witchcraft as a form of heresy in order to focus discussions on the, of the nature of evil on Satan. So Satan was not a totally new invention, but became much more popular as the counterpoint to God in medieval theology. This change in doctrine evolved slowly at the end of the Middle Ages, and the flourishing of treatises on witchcraft began in earnest in the 15th century and extended through the 17th century, a full 200 years. While all cultures believe in some form of magic or witchcraft, this period in Europe saw the most extended and intense enactment of the belief that witches were deliberately malevolent Satan worshipers who sought to undo the work of God and destroy his believers. The widespread teaching of this belief from church pulpits by itinerant preachers and in published works from popular broadsides to weighty treatises explains the extent and the terrible violence of the witchcraft trials, which has threatened the very existence, mortal and immortal, of other humans. It is estimated that 40,000 to 60,000 people died as a result of this hysteria. While prior to the 15th century, men and women were accused of sorcery in equal numbers, during the height of the persecution, four out of five victims were women in England. And in some countries like Germany, women comprised 90% of the victims. While many men were also accused, these men were most frequently related to accused women. 
and were executed less frequently. Most of the women accused were older and poorer. So why women? What, okay, why women? Somebody wants to answer that? Sounded like, let's say misogyny, okay? The Hammer Against Witches, first published in 1487, while not the first treatise on sorcery, was the most popular. And again, I'm going to repeat, second in sales only to the Bible for 200 years. Written by Heinrich Kramer, a clergyman who traveled from village to village trying to root out the heresy of sorcery, it offered very precise, if fanciful, descriptions of what constituted sorcery, how sorceresses might be identified, the tortures that should be used to elicit confessions, how trials should be conducted, and what forms of execution, although generally burning as for all heretics, were recommended. Kramer declared that a number of things were necessary for the performance of sorcery. It could not be undertaken without demons, who offered supernatural powers to the sorceress. Women, as the weaker sex, were more prone to sorcery than men, thus providing fertile ground for demonic activities. And God had to permit sorcery to exist as a punishment for non-believers. And I have another image from the collection. This is the Berkeley Witch. Since women, uh, since, sorry, that was an interesting slip. Since demons were invisible, proof of their existence Proof of their existence had to be found on the sorceress's body or in her confession. There was a sort of mania for proving the existence of sorcery and of demons, and so the interrogation of accused sorceresses was very codified. The accused would be tortured and questioned, and the torture would continue until the answer suited the magistrate, thus providing the desired proof of malevolent activity. The hammer claims the support of a papal bull or decree calling for the extirpation of sorcery. In fact, the bull was published before the treatise, but its inclusion in the work gave it an aura of sanctity. Nonetheless, some towns like Innsbruck pushed back against Kramer's fanatical mission and even accused him of sexual impropriety. Still, the use of this treatise became more widespread as rulers tried to control the rise of heresies, Protestant or Catholic, and of other forms of religious nonconformism. Eventually, by the mid-17th century, the skeptics pushing back against the witchcraft persecution generally won over both rulers and the general public, and executions for sorcery almost disappeared. Yet they, they do still flare up from time to time in various parts of the world. While some scholars claim that the hammer is not a misogynist work, its denigration of women in general would be recognized by modern readers as misogyny. Kramer cites biblical passages to prove that women are not as intelligent or as rational as men, that they are more carnal and less spiritual than men, and that they were created defective. They are more easily prone to evil and to doubting God. Women are quarrelsome, tend to follow their impulses too readily, and refuse to be ruled by men, their superiors. Their tendency, this is Kramer, not me, their tendency to lust makes them easy prey to demons. All right, so here we are. Another image from the collection, a woman easy prey to a demon. Their inferior minds make them more prone to be swayed by evil forces. They lie and deceive men. And here you start to see a, there's a few contradictions in these arguments. If men are superior and they're smarter, then how are women deceiving them? But we'll get back to that. Kramer asserts that if the evil of, and this is a quote, if the evil of women did not in fact exist, not to mention their countless acts of sorcery, the world would remain unburdened of countless dangers. The language of this treatise and of other works on witchcraft is typical of widespread misogynist discourse in medieval and early modern theological, political, and scientific contexts. Base, basing their ideas on humoral theories, intellectual authorities presented women as being more earthly and corporeal, while men were more celestial and spiritual. Women were weak, men were strong. Don't, don't go home with this stuff. Scientists doubting the possibility of women legitimately holding power, which was a significant issue at the time with many women serving as regents or even as queens in their own right, even discussed the activities of a king bee rather than a queen. Many scientists in this period believed that it was a king bee. Theologians cited Paul's admonition that as Christ was the head of man, man was the head of woman thus reaffirming the gender hierarchy that dominated much of Europe at the time of the witchcraft trials. Aristotelian philosophers and medical doctors argued that women were merely undercooked men, that they, 
that they had not developed fully because not enough heat had been present when they were in the womb. If there, you're laughing, but they really believe these things. If there were such a thing as demonic influences, it would make sense that these imperfect humans would be more subject to these influences. This also permitted authorities to teach the necessity of avoiding heretical or uncanonical thinking by using the less valued elements of society as public examples of the consequences of such thinking. Burning at the stake was both a horrible and a dramatic way to die, and this punishment could be seen as a form of state-sponsored terror used to keep the population relatively docile because the executions were always public and very, very well attended. Okay, so more about the context. The quarrel of women. Another element intensified the misogynist aspects of the witchcraft hysteria. Since Christine de Pizan initiated the quarrel of the rose in 1400, which became a long-standing debate over the sort of misogyny found in the Romance of the Rose, a famous medieval work, as well as misogyny more generally, women had been arguing publicly for equal rights, including the right to education and the right to own property. The arguments in favor of this romance and its author, Jean de Main, might seem familiar to us. So I'm going to tell you the arguments. That it was satire, meant to be a joke, and only women without a sense of humor would be angered by the ribald discussions. That de Mont was a genius, and geniuses should be allowed more latitude, excuse me, in their behavior. That it was in fact merely an accurate depiction of women's awful behavior. Women are that way. The debate came to be known as the querelle des femmes, or the quarrel about women, and produced a large quantity of misogynist discourse in manuscripts and later in print, dominating the representation of women for centuries in Europe. However, while some men derided the calls for women's rights, some supported them. Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa, among them, published his Declamation on the Nobility and Preeminence of the Female Sex in 1529, essentially declaring women to be theologically and morally superior to men. Because in this period, power was being consolidated at the center with the appropriation of lands that used to be independent into larger nation states, local customs and laws were increasingly overridden in favor of uniform legal codes, often based on Roman law. As a result, regions that used to grant certain rights to women were absorbed into governing structures that relied heavily on gender difference with the result that in Europe, women gradually lost their right to control their own earnings, to inherit and own property, or to practice most professions in their own right. Theological and political powers relied heavily on misogyny to control women, to keep them from acquiring power or disrupting the social order. The hierarchical family became the ultimate model of this order, with the king often described as the father of his people and the country he ruled as their mother. Thus, there were violent reactions to women's demands for equal rights. These demands were seen as threatening the very fabric of society. It was crucial to put women in their place, keep them subdued and submissive, so that full-blown revolution would not occur. This, at least, was the expressed fear. Conduct books that described the ideal feminine behavior, submissive and dutiful, proliferated in the same period as the witchcraft trials. So let's talk about the role of the Reformation. The calls for increased vigilance of potential cases of witchcraft, the newly elaborated belief in the influence of demons over weak humans, women in particular, also coincided with the upheaval of the Reformation, which called one all-encompassing religious authority into question, as well as the nascent call for women's equality, which menaced the gender hierarchy. The threat of religious difference to the social unity of early modern Europe along with the threat to gender distinctions, was met with the perfect solution, proving the importance of submission to religious authority by means of persecuting witchcraft. This explains the vehemently misogynist language of the witchcraft treatises, as well as the violence of the trials and the executions. This combination of religious tension and disruption of the gender hierarchy is evident in the case of Loudun, where a celebrated trial for sorcery took place in 1634. Loudun had been a Protestant stronghold from 1598, granted that status by the Edict of Nantes, the first edict of religious toleration in France. The Protestant population had been a significant presence in this town since the 1560s, but tensions with the Catholic population continued to increase and reached a boiling point in the 1620s. In this period, a number of editions of the Hammer, 
and most of them are actually in the collection here. 1519, 1584, 1595, 1604, 1620 were produced in Loudun. The trial, conviction, and execution of Urbain Grandier for sorcery thus served the purpose of reinforcing religious orthodoxy as well as of deterring witchcraft. I mention this case in particular because our collection here at Hornell has an amazing collection of documents on this case. All right, now to the interesting part. I hope you haven't fallen asleep. Sexuality. Another element that makes these trials so disturbing is the element of sexuality. Many of the accusations of sorcery revolve around sexuality and reproduction. Impotence and infant mortality seem to be central concerns of many treatises. Infidelity is another obsession, particularly prominent in the hammer. Many of the women accused of witchcraft were practicing midwives or dabbled in popular medicine. It was not unusual for women to do so, as most villages did not have doctors, and frequently the woman in charge of any household took responsibility for medical care. So Kramer and others accused sorceresses of killing babies in the womb or making newborn infants ill. They are accused of making men impotent, even making them believe that their penises have disappeared. And this is an image of a penis tree. <laughs> so Kramer tells the story of a sorceress who would remove men's penises and take them, I told you there would be fun pictures, didn't I? And take them to a nest in a tree in the woods and feed them until somebody came along and asked for them. And the story gets more ribald after that, and they sort of, it must come from some medieval um, fabio or obscene story. Anyway, okay, I'll leave that up to keep you awake. Witches are also accused of making men lust after women who are not their wives. I should actually add that this was made into a pin. There's this huge medievalist conference at Kalamazoo, Michigan every year and apparently this was made into a pin and a number of medievalists wore it and some barista in a coffee shop started blogging on tumblr about the nice medievalists who were wearing this weird pin okay but back to the serious stuff given the strict regulation of sexuality by the church and the social stigma that could result from adultery or any other form of sexuality outside of marriage it was tempting to accuse witches of causing men to feel lust thus excusing these men from responsibility for their own feelings and actions. Kramer's accusations, oh, here we go. Kramer's accusations often border on the ridiculous, sorry. Again, which is stealing penises, keeping them in large numbers and feeding them on a regular basis. He also thought that witches could teleport babies through space or magically insert foreign objects into a pregnant woman's womb that witches eat babies or use their bodies to make magic potions. They can cause violent storms and even make lightning hit whomever they wish to harm. Okay, so we're gonna go away from the penis tree, but I'll go back to it if you want. But this is an image from, from our witchcraft collection of a witch causing horrible storms. Okay, needless to say, many people were skeptical about these claims. People were not all stupid in the early modern period, but the claims still swayed many others into suspicion of women, particularly older women, and particularly women with some knowledge of medicine. So let's talk about good witches and bad witches. Two mythological figures of the witch dominated the literary scene in early modern Europe. Circe, the nymph in Homer's Odyssey, who uses a potion to transform Odysseus's men into pigs, is interpreted in this period as the allegory of the witch's seductress, leading men towards their more bestial natures. But she is generally also seen as easily mastered by men, at least with divine intervention, since the god Hermes gave Odysseus the magical herb Molly to prevent her spell from transforming him. Thus, this allegory is one more example used to justify the dominance of men over women, who clearly lead men astray if they are allowed to do what they wish. Medea who appears repeatedly in plays, epics, and lyric poetry is a much more threatening figure. In the tale of Jason and the Golden Fleece, transmitted through medieval and early modern times by the version Ovid offers in his epic, The Metamorphoses, Medea kills her brother and cuts his body into pieces, scattering it over the waves as she and Jason escape from her native country of Colchis in order to slow her father's pursuit of the escaping marauders who have stolen his treasure. After Jason rejects her, she kills her own sons, 
and gives a poisoned robe to his new bride, the princess of Corinth. In some versions of the tale, Medea also sets the city of Corinth on fire. The list of ingredients for the potion Medea creates to renew Jason's father Aeson's youthful vigor, or alternatively to kill Peleus, her husband's rival, becomes the basis for medieval and early modern descriptions of witches' brews. Roots, seeds, flowers, dark juices, precious stones, the flesh of a screech owl and a werewolf, a snakeskin and a crow's head. Later versions of her tale will augment or vary the ingredients, but this sinister recipe becomes the basis for many depictions of witches, from Shakespeare's Macbeth to the work of J.K. Rowling. Circe thus becomes the model of the over-sexualized woman who must be controlled by men. Once Odysseus masters her, she becomes very helpful, showing him and his men the way home. Medea comes to represent the murderous woman who eludes men's grasp. She always escapes by means of her maleficent magic. She also becomes the figure of the woman ruler, destructive not only of men, but of all society. Catherine de Medici, the queen who served as regent of France for much of the second half of the 16th century, was compared to Medea quite frequently in political pamphlets and other polemical works. These two witches delineated the parameters of women's behavior in the early modern period, the wayward but potentially acceptable woman and her evil counterpart, who was fit only for destruction. They contributed to the misogyny of the period by offering vivid portrayals of witches' behavior. Now let's talk about the legacy of the witchcraft trials. Burr recalled that Andrew Dixon White, and I wish we were in the rare book room because I, I would have asked to have the exact Andrew Dixon White's copy of the Malleus. Andrew Dixon White would display the Malleus Maleficarum to his shuddering class warning them that it had caused more suffering than any other product of human pen. I knew I liked the guy. In the modern era, as discussions of human rights became more widespread, enthusiasm for violent exemplary executions began to diminish. But the violent and irrational misogyny of the Malleus has had a long legacy, one that we still wrestle with today. A recent article from Circe to Clinton, Why Powerful Women Are Cast as Witches, by Madeline Miller, explores the long history of demonizing women in power. Social media images of Hillary Clinton as the wicked witch of the left, with green skin, clutching or riding a broom, and wearing a pointy black hat proliferated during the 2016 elections. And if you don't believe me, just Google Clinton witch, and it's amazing. Miller points out that the words used to designate men who practice magic do not carry the stigma that witch does. Warlock, magus, wizard, sorcerer, all conjure up more positive images. Moreover, the threat that witches represented to children, evident in depictions of them as murderous midwives and in the tale of Medea, is echoed by present day accusations of child trafficking in social media depictions of Clinton. And Clinton is not alone. Julia Gillard, the former prime minister of Australia, has also been depicted as a witch. In more extreme examples of these accusations, some individuals called for Clinton or Gillard to be executed as witches. Although Gillard humorously pointed out that the mode chosen for her, tying her in a bag and drowning her in the sea, would not in fact work for a real witch, because you can't drown a witch. These calls for violence against women seeking power are reminiscent of the violent rhetoric deployed against Catherine de Medici 440 years ago. The legacy of nearly three centuries of witch trials and the rhetoric and representations of women that surrounded them still affect the lives of many women today. The allocation of responsibility for male sexuality to women as the seductresses, already deployed in the myth of Circe and in witchcraft treatises like the Hammer, is still apparent in many legal cases concerning sexual assault. The perverse nature of these arguments, of this attribution of violence to the victims of it, is most apparent in the current use of the phrase witch hunt to denounce the Me Too movement. Whatever one might think of this movement, if one knows about the history of the witchcraft trials, it is not a witch hunt in any strict sense of the term. Ironically, it is precisely the extreme violence of the early modern witchcraft persecutions that makes this phrase so effective, as we recoil in horror at the prospect of its return. At least most of us have long since rejected this violence, thank goodness. One day, we will we'll have done away with the misogyny that fuels it. Thank you. <laughs>